Welcome back to the Difference Maker Podcast. Your hosts, Matt and Chris Calderoni. It's been a couple of weeks. We've had to take some time, do some stuff, upgrade some things, which was really good, obviously, to bring you a better listening experience. Chris, tell them what we have going on. Yeah, we got a new uh, podcast studio that we're coming in with, and I think you guys can hear I'm sick this week, so <laughs> please be light on my uh, my voice a little bit. But new podcast studio. Um, actually, if you guys have any ideas for them, we'd love to hear you know, yes. what we can do on the back of our walls, stuff like that. We're going to change up everything. And um, actually pretty excited just to start off the new year with a fresh look and go from there. We got a new desk. You guys can't see it right now, but maybe in the future. <laughs> That's exactly it. Well, listen, before we get started, we appreciate everybody. Please, again, if you're tuning in on YouTube, like, subscribe, click the notification bell, share this podcast. We're trying to get up to as many viewers as possible. Right now, we're on our road to a thousand we just started our YouTube page. Check that out as well, where we're doing many episodes in regards to just resilience skills. We decided to get away from that a little bit on the podcast and get more into some discussional topics that we feel can really bring you value. So everything's there on YouTube. If you're tuning in from you know, podca- Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever it might be, check us out on YouTube and uh, definitely dig in. So today's topic's one that Chris and I were really going into about and really just talking about how we wanted to... you know just help shift the mindset around this because a lot of times we find athletes often chase success. They don't attract it. High performers in general. Right. And it's like, you see this and it kind of, it, it, it doesn't hurt to watch happen, but it definitely brings some uncomfortableness because a lot of the times what we see and Chris, you can weigh on this when you want, but it's a matter of people that end up thinking they need to really start trying to impress everybody or they need to start changing things up to make other people happy instead of realizing that's because that's chasing it instead of realizing that this is really a game of attraction right right and attraction happens from simply building your skills and understanding that if you work on yourself harder than you do your job harder than you do your sport harder than you do whatever might be if you work hard on yourself like that you'll actually start attracting success. We say it all the time. You've got to become a successful person. You can't just want success. Yeah. Well, like I think I mentioned this a couple times on on a couple different episodes, just very, very briefly. But like you were saying, a lot of guys try to impress people and then when guys and girls, but when you do that, sometimes you pull yourself out of the game that you kind of enjoyed. Like I work with a lot of, a lot of young um junior hockey players and sometimes in their draft year some guys aren't you know some guys are looking to go to nhl camps and stuff like that and it's like that's great and you're really pulled in different directions because obviously sports is it's results based yeah. but like you get notif- noticed by other people when you're consistent with your game and when someone like sees you for who you are and your style of play they look to build teams around that. Yep. Like it, you, if you're not a goal scorer, you're not asked to go be a goal scorer all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. It's more of do your role, do it very well. And I think personally, when you try to master your craft and the thing that you already like to do, like you grew up loving to be that kid that goes into the corners really hard, win sure. the puck and all that stuff. If you master that and you enjoy doing that, man, you're having fun while improving on yourself and on your game and all you're doing is just raising your name on a list of other players that are in your exact same category well even to just kind of hit on that too i was talking to one of our nba players the other day yesterday literally and we were talking about how you know it's funny like everybody thinks that pro athletes don't have those same insecurities or whatever it might be and that's such a load of shit like honestly like it's Every high performer, I think I've learned this from being one myself and working with them. Every high performer has insecurities. 
I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if you're at the peak of your game. I don't care if you're climbing the ladder. Every high performer has insecurities. And you know why I think that? Uh, just to jump Please. in really quick. I think that's because like, because high performers are normally at the top or have that status. Yes. You want to, you're not nervous to lose it, but you there's a desire. Stupid. Yeah, of course. There's a desire to maintain that level. Absolutely. Right? And that's, well, this is exactly what I was talking about with our, with our guy yesterday. And it's like, you know, a guy who's getting paid millions of dollars a year still comes in with the worry in the back of his mind about looking stupid, right? That, that's just natural. That's high performance. You go into a room, we always hear that adage, I think, right? Or that quote where it's like, um, for example, like Steve Jobs always wanted to be the dumbest person in the room. It's like, have you ever tried that? Yeah. That, that's hard, man. Like I, I'll, I went out to a meeting with a really successful individual on, on uh, Monday night. And I'll tell you, it was probably one of the most, he shook me up, like literally shook me up. And it's not that he was trying to or anything like that. It's just like, you really come home from things like that. And you're like, I'm really not thinking big enough. Right. I'm really not looking big enough, even though we think pretty big to go with. Right. But it's like, when you're at the top, when you're at the pinnacle, when you're at a performance-based environment where that that desires or depends on your results it's natural to get into the spot where you feel like you have to impress others and you don't want to look stupid and when we were when I was talking to this NBA player the other day the real thing of attracting success was like dude it's a matter of getting selfish to be selfless right and we say that all the time on the show but it's like what does that really mean? Getting selfish to be selfless means that you're working harder on yourself so you actually have something to give to people. Like, I can't stand the people that call themselves people pleaser, pleasers and label themselves that because it's like, that's probably one of the most negative things you could do for yourself. You cannot give anything to somebody else if you don't have anything to give, if you haven't worked on yourself, right? And it's like, I want to help everybody. It's like, here, great. You totally can. You totally can be one of the most impactful players on the team, but you have to realize you need to work on attracting success and building something consistently so that you have to give it to your team. I think people pleasing is when you're currently working on yourself or, or sometimes when you currently don't necessarily know what you bring to the table and what you do really well. I think that's a, a resort to like you resort to, I'll do anything for the team, which is like there. That's there a load of aspects, crap, man. <laughs> but I mean, I think that Sorry. that's what people listen. I'm not like, go back to not to cut you off and not to chop chop this idea down in any negative way. If you truly think that LeBron James is quote unquote doing anything and everything for the team, he might say it, but let's talk about it for a second. He's taking control of the game doing it his way selfishly because he knows that's the best way to help the team. No, for sure. I'm just saying, right. I'm just saying he knows, he knows what he, what he brings to the table. For sure. I think what I'm trying to say is like the people pleasing aspect when guys, when people resort to that, it's because they don't necessarily know or are confident in their abilities to oh, bring to the team. I'm agreeing with that's you. I, I think, mean. I think it's a cop out. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's yeah. an absolute cop out. Listen, we have a top NBA player that we work with. And one of the things that really took him over that hump this year, he was always a quote unquote team guy and there's nothing wrong with that. But he learned finally what it meant to truly bring something to the team. Yeah. Listen, if you want to be a team guy or gal, no problem with that. No problem with that. But you need to face the reality of what that actually means. You cannot be a team player if you haven't worked on yourself harder than you do on the team in the past. It's impossible. It's impossible. That's like me coming to the table, coming to a dinner party with no dinner, no food that I bring, no plates, nothing. I just show up and it's like, I'm going to eat everybody else's food. That's what happens. And if you want to be somebody who is truly able to impact the team on a deep level, you have to realize the only proven way to do that is to know what your strengths are, to work on those strengths and, and to consistently keep them sharp. And there's nothing wrong with being like a, not, I think people get too afraid of being called a one-dimensional player mm -hmm. but in a team sport like you are required to do things that other people are not required to do and that's yes. part of being a team right and i like to take an extreme example like like look at the ufc yep. right they do not they do not get like they're not necessarily complete fighters they have that one style 
they go really in on it they they master it and then it's kind of like well this is my style come in come and beat me yeah you know and it's, and a, it's a lot of film watching and adaptability like listen even though i know he's out of it right now and he's going through the whole issue right now with the ufc but conor mcgregor was one of the most continuous innovators i've ever seen in that sport right like from different weight classes to different fight styles to so on. Because I know from working with our guys in, in MMA and UFC, it's like they, it's to your point, they have one style, they go deep on it. And then it's like, and I'm going to do some other stuff just to make sure it's it's kept into check. Yeah. It's like right? beat, beat my style right. with yours. Absolutely. And, and like, then you can take that to, and again, everyone that's listening, I'm not, you know, I don't study the UFC. No. I, don't, I don't go in on it or anything. This is just a perspective from someone that, base baseline knows anything mm-hmm. um what i see in that is okay they they master their specific style and skill why can you not do that in a team sport yes and and be renowned for it like like known and and sought after to bring that value to a team yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with that i do think points and results and stuff like that can kind of distract you from that but again that's that's where where you're not attracting success you're you're chasing you're chasing it i like that right? and and you know what you're bang on with it because it's funny so i i think of soccer what we know very well football if you let look at some of the greats like great like messi ronaldo maradona tati del piero like greats like remembered athletes right they didn't jump from a center forward to a center midfielder to a left back. They didn't do that. Mm-hmm. They didn't jump from right back to midfield to right winger. They didn't do that. There's few players that can, but very few do. I look at players and athletes that don't reach their true, in my opinion, potential. Right? Mm-hmm. I look at a Florenzi who... He's a. It, it, this is a very deep soccer analogy for anybody that knows the sport if you pay attention to him. But this is a player to give a very basic example who started as what a winger. He he was no he was a central midfielder I believe. Central midfielder. Yeah. Right. Gets plagued with injuries, so he has to quote unquote adapt. Comes back kind of shifting between wing and and, and a back position. Yeah. Right. He he was he was labeled a utility man. A utility man. In yeah. my opinion. That is by far one of the worst things that could happen. It gets it's tough. It's very tough. It's tough. And the pro like you can have a long career. Listen, he's he's still playing, he's still doing his thing, he's bounced between a couple teams, right? No problem. But if you truly like that to me is somebody who maybe got a little bit into chasing success. And I know how those those conversations go because we've been on that side with sports agents where it is, okay, well, so-and-so's at a point in their career now where they just need to play a role. I get that. When you get to a certain age, no questions asked. When you have physical limited abilities because of how long you've been playing the sport, totally understand that. When you're peaking and priming, though, in my opinion, from your earlier 20s to your late 20s, early 30s, you should be 100% specializing in something. See, I think, though, that's where the team behind them they sometimes fall short. Like, if if you're a specific type of player, where whether you're on the field, on the ice, wherever it is, you're a specific type of player, and there you get injured, you lose the opportunity to be that starter in that position that you can best excel at. That's where, in my opinion, you find another yes. opportunity where you can go be that individual. 100%. And you know what? For his case, he just got stuck in the team. Like, yeah. he loved that that AS Roma. He he wanted to be a lifer sure. like like Tati was there, right? 100%. And did Aussie. Like, he had examples. So there there's different aspects to it. I think, personally, that's when someone outside of the bubble, outside of the situation, like someone on your, your team, your agent, your, your coach, your manager, whoever it is, says, hey, unfortunately, right now, this is what we have. I can send you somewhere else to excel in that position. Yeah. And maybe, you know what? Maybe you turned it down. I don't know. But yep. And this is where it comes right back to the principle we just opened with attracting success. So, to Chris's point, if you do get told that you're going to be a player who's now a role guy or gal or whatever it might be, and that's where you're at right now in this position, go attract more success. So, how do you do that? You build more skills. 
How do you do? Well, and if it's like, well, Matt, I have all my skills. It's like sharpen them, do it better, learn more. You know what? This is this is also so. I'm always going to fall in the sword of the athlete. I always will. That's what our mandate is. That's how we do things, right? We're athlete first. However, there are situations where I truly understand and know athletes sometimes need to suck it up and keep moving. Oh, 100%. Everybody does, right? It's like, oh, well, I'm good at this. It's like, be better then. Learn more. When was the last time that you sat down, studied your film, got better, truly pushed yourself and really excelled? We see this all the time with athletes that are around late 20s. This is a very big trend with pro athletes that we get forwarded, that we get referred from, uh, from agents. This is the biggest trend that I've seen happening with them and the biggest pattern we notice in their psychology where it's like they know what they're good at. They've always been doing it, right? They've been doing it since they got into the league. But then there's a point of not even comfort. I'm not going to call it comfort because they're not comfortable. But a point of I've capped out on this. It's like, no. You stop sharpening your sword. There's a big difference. One hundred percent. And the easiest way to to see that is again asking someone from outside of the bubble to say, "Hey, yep. can you just take two seconds to look at my game here and here and here because I think I should deserve this many minutes or this much ice time or whatever the case may be." Can you just take a look at it as yeah. someone that's not on the team that I don't have to worry about politics? That's going to give it to me straight. Do I deserve the minutes? Do I deserve this? You get told no. I mean, it's a pretty simple. It, it's 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 calling yourself on on the bullshit, and you've yeah. been in the bubble for too long. Who can help me get out of it? And yep. that's hard to do. But sometimes that's all you need to hear in order to say, okay, hold on. Yeah, maybe I got to check myself. Well, and this is where even for parents to pivot for a second, if you do have a high performing athlete that you're dealing with, you need to realize as well that you're responsible for putting this mindset on your athlete. You're the parent. You're the leader, right? I see so many parents who get caught up in comparing their kid to another kid on the team. That is by far, like, let me be very clear on this show. That is by far one of the worst things you could do for a child is to start comparing them to other children around them. Even if you do it in good intent, please listen to me on this. Don't compare to other kids with good, like, don't, don't do that to try and teach the skill. Don't do that. You can have coaches that lead. You can have uh, coaches that use players to demonstrate. If coaches want to do that, that's totally fine. But do not go out of your way as a parent to start comparing and comparing and comparing and comparing. That literally puts a belief system onto athletes. And I will tell you from having this conversation with athletes later on in their 20s that had parents who had good intent, who put a belief system on them that you need to compare and look to others to see how successful you are. And you know what? I That comes from, I guarantee you that comes from parents thinking, yes, my kid can handle, like they're old enough to handle it. They're not. They're, they're not. And, they're not. And it's it's no fault of your own. It's just like having that reality check to say, okay, um, this is something I got to be careful Mindful of so of, that yeah. like my kid can legitimately move past that. Like if they're always catching someone at their age, what do you think they're going to be taking a look at later on? Yes. They're going to look at all the draft, draft yes. lists. They're going to look at who has points in front of me. They're just going to be chasing as opposed to just Attracting. working on their own game. Yes. And that me and even to go in on Chris's point, this is why we always say the role models you should use are the ones at the pro level. We're not asking you to develop your child into a professional athlete at the age of five. What we're saying is start teaching them if they want to be able to become one of the best at what they do or they want to strive for excellence in their life in any any area, find the people who are already successful and don't compare them. Start teaching them. One of the most natural forms for human beings to learn is is through observation. Mm -hmm. It's discovery learning. And there's nothing wrong with being like, all you're doing is you're being a setup guy for your kid. Yes. You don't, to run a business, you do not need to know absolutely everything that goes into the business, but you better surround yourself with people that know how to do things really, really, really well. And if you don't know the skills at the top level, go like, you, you guys have your own, um, role models and people that you used to admire. Mm-hmm. Why don't you show them that? Yeah. One. Of, well, hey, one of to go on Chris's point for anybody tuning in. One of the best tactics that we use with athletes and resilience skills that we use with athletes at the pro level, we actually bring them back to the to the icons they used to watch as a child that got them to where they are. Because let's not get it twisted either. Pros start comparing themselves to pros in the league, right? That's not that's a real thing at the professional level. It's like where do you go? It's like go back to your role models. 
Go back to those that you followed as a kid. Go back to those people that got you to where you are. Like I think one of the most vital keys for chase or for for attracting success in your life is constantly being able to go back to your to your quote kid mindset and say like what did I really want then and staying clear on that. And you know what? Just if there are any parents watching, it's hard to do yeah. because we know that you want to be the individual that can help your kid out the most. You will Absolutely. always want to do that. And it's hard to put down the pride to say, hey, there's someone else here that can that you can check out. Now, a lot of people don't have trouble with that. I'm not not mm -hmm. necessarily, you know, and that's it's probably a learned skill that those people picked up, yep. those parents picked up, because it's a hard thing to do and it's a hard thing to overcome, especially if you had some success in that sport. Yeah, it's true. And it's like, you know, the best resources you should always be leaning on are coaches like ourselves, mentally, physically, nutritionally, if that's the case. If you're not an expert in it, don't try to be, right? It's like, where do most businesses fail when, they, when one person tries to do everything instead of scaling it out and giving it to experts? It's the same with an athlete. It's the exact same with an athlete. And athletes, for you tuning in, it's the same thing with you. You need to start surrounding yourself with experts if you want to attract success. Listen, the success you're currently experiencing in your life right now, good or bad, is an absolute result of the work you put in on yourself. There is no way around that. I've, I've learned that as being a coach. Listen, I started this business when I was 22 years old. I was one of the youngest mental coaches to work with a, a pro athlete in the NHL at 22 and a half. And the individual was 28 at the time. And it's like, I just started from nothing. I just opened this business and started reaching out to agents. And it's like, how does it happen that way? Well, let me tell you. You start building the skills you need in order to talk to people with that level of a stature. Yeah, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a ballsy move, but that's how everything is learned in life, right? Like if you're an athlete, if you want to get to the next level, if you want to be a top, top, top scorer, a top goalkeeper, top defender, top coach, whatever it is, start attracting success by working on yourself. That's the only listen. All your excuses are bullshit. Here's why. We have athletes that have made it out of the ghetto. Straight up out of tough situations, right? Had that before. So right away, that's not an excuse. We've had athletes who have come from single parent families make it to the pro levels. That's not an excuse. We've had athletes who have made it without the right financial conditions they need, but have worked on themselves. That's not an excuse. We've had athletes who have had everything and lost it and then found it again. That's not an excuse. All of this doesn't matter what high performance level you're at in life. If you take an internal focus on your success, you will be successful. You'll be able to do it. You'll be able to crush it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you because we see it all the time. There's no excuse. Success is internally attracted by the work you put on a, in on yourself. I've gotten into spells before. I'll never forget this. This is my discipline. This is my... So we operate off of fear... Uh, or not fear, sorry. Off of pain and pleasure, right? We'll do whatever we got to do as human beings to avoid pain and gain pleasure. 2018, 2019 was the one year... I use as my quote unquote trigger of pain. It was the worst year of our career in business because I got comfortable. I stopped working on myself. Then I went, I stopped reading the books. I stopped doing the work. I stopped going through the skills and doing the reflecting. Cause I'm not saying you need to learn every day. What I'm saying though, is you need to reflect. You need to work on yourself. You need to understand what's working and what's not. I stopped doing all that. I got lazy. I thought I mastered it. Listen, mastery is something you need to maintain. So when you're going through this, if you are in a slump, if you are in a spot, if you're not as successful as you want to be right now, attract it. Stop chasing it. Attract it. Get back to working on yourself. And Review. <clears throat> I do think one of the easiest ways to get out of those slumps is um, thinking like, put it in, in terms of this. So if you're a specific type of player in whatever sport, you're, you're in, you're, you have a certain style of play, and you're in this category with a bunch of other people. All you're looking to do is raise yourself to the top of that list mm -hmm. uh, of that category. Because who's going to look past you if, if you're top 10? Even? Yeah. Who's going to look past you? Because teams, as a team sport, they need to fill every position. There's many different philosophies of how teams play. Some teams are rougher. Some teams are more possession-based. Some teams are more skilled-based, whatever it is master your style and category of player yep. get to the top of that list and that's it and the best part is you don't know <laughs> that 
you don't know where you fall on that list. Yeah. All you have to do is continue working until you believe, and maybe you're, you'll never believe that, which is great. But until you're at the top of that list and that style of play and that category of player. Yeah. And listen, until you get to the top and you're at the pro level, you haven't, you haven't hit your potential yet. Mm-hmm. Right now you might be saying, well, Matt, my, my top level is D one. My top level is just local. That's fine. Get to your top level. And if you get to that top level, here's how I did it. Here's how I went pro. Okay. I was a very late blooming soccer player, goalkeeper. I think I was playing house league until the age of like 13, which was just before I was going into grade nine, where the majority were already playing at some of the top rep levels for soccer. Okay. So here's how it went for me. I'll never forget the summer that my dad asked me, do you want to try uh, try out for All-Star? I said, sure. I was 12 years old, right? 11 years old. Did really, really well in house league. Dad asked me, do you want to try for, for All-Star now? Sure. Went out, did it, worked well, crushed it. It's like, okay, great. Did that for one season. Then dad asked me next year, okay, you did All-Star. Do you want to try and go, go to the rep side? Sure. Low level rep. Okay. Worked at it, went hard, had a jerk of a coach, didn't really know how to work on myself. I was 12 years old, right? Like young. Faced my first set of adversity, dropped back. Okay. Went back down to house. league. couldn't do it. Had a coach at the all-star level. I went back to all-star that year, midway through the season, had a coach, Joe, who completely changed my life, had patience with me, developed me, put me to the goalie schools, all that kind of stuff. I got better. I got better. I got better. Worked on myself, worked on myself. I go into grade nine now. Okay. Grade nine had a friend on the team. Carm, I'll never forget him. Goes, um, Hey, you should come try out for rep with me. So, all right, let's do it. I've worked on myself. Give it another go. Made it. Okay. Great. Played there. Went really hard. Worked on it. Worked on it. Worked on it. Worked on it. Grade 10 made a jump, went to a team at a higher level of rep, played with them for the winter. Parents went through a rough time, decided to come stay back in Pickering and play back for my Pickering team. Okay, great. Even though I could play at the next level, though, I worked on myself, worked on myself, worked on myself. And it's like, how far can I take this, right? Then it's like, okay, I'm in grade 11 going into grade 12. No scholarships, no schools offering me anything. None of that. Work on myself, work on myself, work on myself. Send emails, send them to the, to the university coaches locally here in Ontario. Great. Get one school to hit me back. Ontario Tech University, UOIT at the time. Offer me a full scholarship that they can give in Canada um, for Canadian-based players. Great. Take that. It's like, okay, now I'm going into my freshman year. Work on myself, work on myself, work on myself. Great. I got freshman of the year now, my first year of university. Awesome. Got rookie of the year for the entire school. Awesome. Okay. Then it's like, you know what? I'm, I'll never forget the conversation I had that winter with my, with my coach. Um, he was much older. I said, I want to try and go pro. He goes, you want to try and go pro? I said, I want to try and go pro. Why not? He goes, you're going to finish your degree. I said, I'm going to, honestly, I said, whatever opportunity comes, I'm going to try and take it. He goes, why don't you try this first? Work hard on yourself so that you can try and at least play for the university team that Toronto FC had at the time. It's like, okay, that's a good idea. Worked on myself, worked on myself, went there in the, in the winter time, was able to make it, stayed there for about eight weeks. And I was like, I can do this. Played there in the winter. I'll never forget that second year of university. Going into it that summer, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going pro. I'm trying. And it's like work, 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 work. Then you get to that pro level and that's where I, I capped and hit it, right? But my point is I didn't start off knowing right away that I was going to go pro. It's like, to your point, find it right? Like hit your, hit your potential and then ask yourself, can I go higher? And it's like, okay, hit that potential. And it's like, can I go higher? Can I go higher? It's just a constant question of asking yourself, can I go higher if you want it? Right. It works in business. It works in sports. It works in life. It's like, can I take this to another level? Can I take it to another? You will know when you get there, when you can or can't. And I don't think it's based off of like your, uh, your history at all. Like, like you can legitimately start this today yep if you really wanted to in in working for yourself because like it's the one thing that it's easy to get trapped in in the whole um here i'm there i'm doing this i'm doing that it's it's not going to work out in this when in reality it's like it's the next day that you just gotta get through yeah and now to tail off that for a sec we are not saying if you are 32 years old never stepped into a professional (laughs) sports arena or a competitive one you can go make it there. I mean, hey, dreams to reality. If you want to be that guy, prove us wrong or gal. But our point is, is like, you know, keeping this in context, 
to be very clear on that. Mm -hmm. What Chris is saying is if you haven't been working on attracting success and you've only been chasing it up to this point, you can easily switch it right now. Yeah. Like I mean for this season. Like yep. if you're currently in a season right now, first half didn't go necessarily how you planned. You're stuck on the fourth line. You're stuck on the bench. You're not switch it. You know, doing this and that and everything else. There's no reason why you cannot turn it around for the next practice and continue to move forward. Yeah. However, it's not going to be just a week of practices that's going to do this. Say. It's going to be consistency. I think everybody needs to realize success is a moment by moment thing, meaning like it takes one action. It literally requires one action at a time. We think it's that it's these massive actions when if you've ever really broken down what a massive action is, it's just a bunch of series of small actions that led up to that one big thing, right? So it's like, to Chris's point, there's a lag effect with everything. Well, yeah, it's kind of like a, a kind of cool example. I was thinking about this yesterday was um, when you guys, whoever's listening, maybe you have moved out, maybe you're living on your own. When you do move out, you now have to cook for yourself for oh. the first time in your life. And you have no idea what you're necessarily doing. First couple times, for sure, you're going to burn something. You're yep. going to set off the fire alarm. There's going to be, you know, something that happens or it's just going to taste terrible. But it's a necessity and something that you have to continue to <laughs> improve on Keep building. and work, right? Whether it just be starting to make out pasta or whatever. But you only necessarily have three meals a day and you're capped by your money on how many things you can improve on each day. Yep. So think of it like that. It's like you can only work on so many things in one day and in one week. Mm -hmm. But after time you're going to start getting pretty good at cooking yourself. And for any of the keeners, that's a great analogy too. And for any keener that's tuning in, we're not, so you have to understand that mastery really takes around 30 days to really master to the next level of a skill, right? If you're somebody just starting this out and you're like, I want to go work on everything right now. Chill out, realize, pick one skill, pick the most, ask yourself this, what's the one skill I can work on right now that will literally take me to the next level? You might have three things you need to work on, but it's like we do when we set our targets for business and with our athletes. It's like, what's the one thing right now for the next 30 days you need to absolutely master to get to the next level? My shot. Okay, go work on your shot. Realize there's going to be a lag effect. Work on it. Go reassess after 30 days. But here's the funny part. When you do get to work, don't think like Chris said, because one day of work that all of a sudden things change, right? Really understand this. Nobody's going to see it until it happens. What do I mean by that? You're going to be working on yourself quietly for the next probably month. That's how this goes. After that month, you're going to have something to maybe start to show a little bit. After two months, you're going to have a lot to show. After three months, people are going to be attracted to it. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Usually 90 day cycles, right? We see this in our business when we do marketing. I mean, this is a great example for it too. We started a marketing campaign a little bit ago we are just starting to see the return on that, right? And it's like, why? Well, month one was all about building it. Month two is about optimizing it. We're still in month two. Month three, it's going to be pinnacle, right? That's the same thing when it comes to athletes and working on yourself. It's just, yeah, it's just hard. It's accepting that you're eager. You're limited in the time that you have each day to improve what you want to improve. Yeah. That's all. And, and that's why we're saying pick the most important one for right now and go in on it and go in on and it. and if you look at any of the most successful entities things people in the world they all started they all have a very mundane slowish start right it goes right back to the um to the old adage overnight success is not a real thing it's true like we see success it's like we see all the time with players that want to role model somebody right it's like i need to be there i need to be at the top right away it's like hold on study this individual when they were around your age if that's the case right look at what they were doing then it sometimes also helps them to keep you patient in your process because it's like wow you know what i i really know i am like i used to panic over this i used to get anxious over this all the time it's like oh my god my business it's only eight years and we haven't blown up to five million followers and blah 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 it's like hold on you're studying people at the wrong time yeah you know what i am curious i wonder like guys that that perform really well re when they're really young. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everyone's kind of the same in the sense of you're 
you're not necessarily the strong person or anything like that because you're young. You're still developing and all that stuff. But I'm curious to know if it's just that maybe they figured out the technique. And then once they got the technique and they're comfortable with that, you can just, you can add new things onto it. Like obviously it, it, it all takes practice, right? But I think of Connor Bedard right now. Yep. Like his forearms are friggin' massive. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got a shot like he can take from anywhere and at any angle. And it's like, I wonder if like when you're younger, you, you discover the technique and then once you get that and you go forward, I'll tell you, it actually isn't, it's proven in habit, habit building. So that Chris is a, he's pointing out a great example. So the other day I heard a really good quote from Joe Rogan's podcast and he was talking about like, forget about what Einstein was doing at the age of 30 and blah, 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 blah. Like, don't worry about that. Throw that shit out. Just focus on you. And it's like, great. I think where a lot of people get that wrong and it's like, well, by 15 years old, player A was doing this. It's like, hold on. Look at something for a second. Okay. It's not the amount. It's not the age that they were at that they got so good. Look at me late blooming in soccer. I didn't get good till I was 17. Okay. Not even close. But the amount of repetitions that all the other kids were putting in around me until the age, I didn't practice as much as they did. I didn't, I didn't have rep soccer five times a week when I was six years old like they did. You know when I had it? Once a week on Saturdays when we had games. So I worked on it on Saturdays when I had games. The amount of, so it's natural, right? It comes right down to the 10,000 hour rule if you believe in that. But really it's a repetition rule. It is the more repetitions that you put in, and how much earlier you start is when it goes there. So it's like, that's why you can see businesses that don't do anything for 20 years. Because it's like, it's not, a, it's not a matter of how long you've been in business for. It's not a matter of how long you or how old you are as an athlete and when you should be peaking. It's how much work did you put in until now? Did you put in all the work, all the repetitions, the same amount that, for example, Connor Bedard did until he was this age? No, probably not. It's like Lionel Messi. Everybody's blown away by Lionel Messi. If you read that man's biography... His mother tells a story about how he used to play for hours a day in the streets of Argentina facing his older brother and lose. Hours a day. This guy did it for like six days a week, close to sometimes up to eight hours a day. He was in the street playing soccer just so he could beat his brother. He even played, and this is where it kind of goes to prove the point. Even though he was playing against his brother who was older than him and could beat him because he was just naturally stronger, Leo trained more than his brother did just to beat his brother. Leo's brother didn't get noticed at 12 years old. Leo did. Leo went on to be one of the best in the world. Why? And they've broken this down, especially in his, bio, in, in his autobiography. It's because he took that much time without even knowing it, that he was doing repetition after repetition after repetition after repetition. He put in more work than the majority of kids his age did. There's another pattern of a player we see that with. His name's Cristiano Ronaldo. Funny how these are two of the best players in the world. Known for an unrelenting work ethic even before he became pro. Why? It's not because Ronaldo was born with some kind of talent that was m unmatchable from other people. There were amount of repetitions that were put in from a very young age that you have to realize. Do not start counting the clock based on your age, start counting the clock based on when you start putting in that kind of specific work towards something. It's like us with marketing, right? We can't count the clock until we actually start this marketing thing. We didn't start this marketing thing till like three months ago for real, for real, for real, right? We are starting the clock, not from being in business since 2015. We're starting the clock from three months ago. You need to realize things like that as well. So let's wrap this up, keeping it simple. It's a real, real good topic today, but Success is attracted, not chased. In any walk of life, if you're an athlete, a business pro, whatever, start attracting success. How do you do that? You pick one skill, you work on it for the next 30 days, and you wait to see results for the next 90. That's when you should start picking your head up and being like, huh, are people taking note? If you care about that, you probably shouldn't, but if you care about that, do not expect anything at least until 90 days. Work hard. Harder on yourself than you do your sport and realize this is a selfish to get selfless thing, right? So before we wrap this up, any last words? Um, 
No, uh, like we were saying before at the beginning anyways, check out our YouTube channel, guys. There's going to be some exclusive stuff there that we don't necessarily cover on the podcast. Um, you can also check us out on Twitter. We'll be making sure to continuously post those videos um, and just a bunch of other things on there. So, And you got to go to our YouTube channel. Yeah. Right? YouTube channel right now, it's top. It's pumping. We're gaining subscribers each day. We're trying to bring this literally by April to 1,000 subscribers. We're really going to push hard for that. I know it's a big goal. I know it's bodacious. I know it's heavy, but we feel we can do it. Your support will help with that. Please check us out. M-O-L-L-I-T-E-U-M. Subscribe. Click the notification bell. We're bringing you resilient skills every week. You can train on it. We literally just did one on mental reps. We taught you the sets and reps we do. We even gave you a downloadable track there that you can utilize if you want to be able to practice mental reps. We give you how many times a week to do it. It's fantastic stuff, but please check us out there. If you are watching us or tuning in on YouTube too, um, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. So other than that, if you need anything, check us out, moliteum.com, M-O-L-L-I-T-E-U-M.com. See if you can apply to work with us. Maybe we're a good fit for you. Maybe you need something like this. If not, we'll see you all next week. Stay resilient.